Even if you've been using an iPhone for years, there are some features relating to security that you should probably enable, or at least consider enabling, depending on your preference and situation. So that is what I'm gonna go over. I'm Theo Joe, and let's get into it. I've got about 10 of them. Starting off, we have the accessory trust feature, and this is actually new in iOS 26. And you can find this under settings, privacy and security, then scroll down to the bottom and look for wired accessories. This setting determines whether or not your phone will explicitly ask you if you want to trust accessories connected via USB to a computer or something else. I believe it defaults to automatically allow when unlocked, but I would personally suggest setting it to ask for new accessories. The reason is that there is potentially a risk for plugging in a USB device and then letting your iPhone trust it. For example, there's been warnings about so-called juice jacking where you plug into what you think is a power port, but it ends up being a malicious device. And you could debate whether or not that's actually likely to be a reality. However, let's say it is, and you plug in your phone while you're using it because maybe it's running low on battery, then if your phone is already unlocked, it's immediately gonna have access to your phone. Whereas if you plug it in and it asks whether or not you wanna trust some accessory, but you thought it was just a power port, well, that would probably set off some alarm bells and you can avoid that. Though I did notice this might not show up on all models like my iPhone SE, it didn't show it. All right, next up is a find my setting called send last location. You can find this under settings and then click your account at the top, then find my, find my iPhone, and then enable the setting called send last location. This makes it so if your phone's battery is critically low, it will actually send off one last hurrah basically, so that if you go to check its location, if you lost it or something, it'll have it. This is probably more useful if you legitimately can't remember where your phone went as opposed to it being stolen. Anyway, apparently for privacy reasons, Apple does not actually check and store the location of your phone constantly. It's only if you do a find my check on the location of the phone, normally at least. But that also means that if you lost your phone and it died before you realized, then if you went to try and do a find my check on it, apparently it's just not gonna return a location. That is, unless you have this setting enabled and then it would have done that. So if you legitimately lost your phone, it's probably not gonna be moving. So that would be a lot more helpful. Now, before I continue, something else that's helpful is from today's sponsor, Ugreen, and that's their new Ugreen NASSYNC DH2300, a network attached storage device that's like having your own personal cloud for backups and more right on your local network using your own hard drives. It has wide compatibility with third-party hard drives up to 30 terabytes each. So with two drive bays, that means a total capacity of up to 60 terabytes. The setup process is easy too. It takes less than 10 minutes, and it also has advanced options for those who want it. And when you set up the drive, using RAID redundancy as recommended, all your data is always copied to both drives simultaneously. So your data is safe even if one drive fails. Plus with the Ugreen NAS Sync mobile app, not only can you manage the NAS and its settings remotely or locally, but also set up automatic backup of your iPhone's photo albums. You can also set up time machine folders for automatic backups of your Mac too. And the app itself can easily be found by just tapping the NFC point with your phone on the front of the device here. In the web interface, there's also a bunch of apps you can install like for storing your media where it can be accessed or streamed to other devices on your network, as well as the ability to set up multiple accounts and permissions. It's got good connectivity too, with two USB 3.2 ports, an HDMI port, and gigabit ethernet. And since you can back up files right through your local network, you'll get the full gigabit speed. And it's a lot faster than a typical upload speed of Google Drive, for example, even if you have a gigabit internet plan. So be sure to check out the link in the description and check out the Ugreen NASSYNC DH2300 and use the code for 20% off. That's the same price as Black Friday. And with all that being said, let's continue. Okay, moving on, we actually have some stuff that you probably want to disable. And it has to do with what stuff is accessible from the lock screen. You can get to these options by going to the settings again, face ID and passcode, or touch ID and passcode. Then scroll down to the section called allow access when locked. And if I were you, I would probably just disable all the ones that I have disabled here. For control center, the reason is that a thief, if they steal your phone, then that means even if the phone is locked, they can swipe down and then toggle off Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and put it into airplane mode and all that, and potentially hinder your ability to actually use the Find My Network. For Siri, I would turn that off because Siri can do a lot. I'd also disable reply with message and return missed calls, even if just to prevent accidental texts and phone calls to people if they called you and for some reason it, the screen turned on, you don't wanna be accidentally dialing people. For the wallet setting, disabling this makes it so even if you double tap the side button while the phone is locked, it will not actually show any info about your cards and stuff. It just makes you do a face ID authentication. And this one is a no brainer to me because even if you have it enabled, you can't actually use it to pay 
unless you do face ID anyway. So having it on basically just lets anyone double tap and see what kind of cards you have saved in your phone without giving you any extra convenience. It makes no sense, just turn that off. Home control, this is another one I think is a no brainer. I don't think you really want people to, for example, unlock your front door if you have a smart lock or mess with your devices in your physical home with the phone being locked. And even if you don't have any smart home devices you set to control with your phone, you may as well just turn it off just in case for the future. For today view and search, this lets you search through and see what apps are on your phone and other stuff, you might not want that. But more importantly, it allows anyone to just swipe left from the screen and see any widgets you have set up there and use them. Or even just accidentally, you're more prone to have it turn on and swipe over and activate one of those things. Better to just have it off. All right, moving on, we have a specific option in the stolen device protection feature. You can find the stolen device protection feature under privacy and security. And if you don't have it enabled in general, I would definitely enable the feature. I believe it asks you at one point whether or not you wanted to enable it. So if you didn't, definitely enable it. Anyway, under security delay, usually the default option is when you're away from familiar locations, but I would set this to always. Now, as for why this is the case, it takes a bit of context for how this feature works. Basically, how stolen device protection works is it, it requires you to actually use biometrics, not your phone pin for certain critical settings that you might go to change, or more importantly, if a thief goes to try and change after they watched you put in your pin or tricked you into doing it, like asking you to use their phone and then make it force lock and then say, oh, your phone's locked. And when you go to try and help out and unlock your phone, they watch you enter your pin. And before this feature, simply knowing your phone pin allowed them to do everything with your whole Apple account, including changing the account password, making it so you were literally never able to recover it again, like setting up a security key, encrypting everything. I mean, it was absolutely insane. So this feature is really important for that by requiring certain things to use biometrics, which obviously a thief is not gonna be able to probably do. And then for certain especially important things, like maybe changing your whole account password, there's an additional delay where you have to authenticate with your biometric like Face ID, then do an hour delay and then authenticate again. And I guess the reason is if a thief steals your phone and they know about this and there was no delay, they could simply go to the setting they wanna change, like the most important one, like the Apple account password, and then simply hold it up to your face before you realize what's going on. And then they'd be able to change it and run away or whatever. Whereas with this, they would have to hold it up to your face wait an hour, find you again, and do it again. Unlikely. Anyway, going back to the familiar locations thing, the reason you want to set it to always is Apple does not actually tell you what these familiar locations are or let you set them. There is a thing hidden deep in the settings for common locations you've been to, but there's no way to know when one of those locations becomes a familiar location. And I would think that if you have a favorite hangout spot, like a cafe or something that you're at a lot, and if it marks it as a familiar location, well, just the fact that you're there more often probably means you're more likely to have your phone stolen there. And then if a thief does that, they can just bypass all your stuff. So I would just set it always and not worry about it. Okay, now moving on, this is more of just a tip if you do happen to lose your phone or have it stolen ever. You probably already know about the lost mode that lets you kind of lock down your phone if it's lost and it requires extra stuff to unlock so a thief can't really use it or try your password, stuff like that. But with that feature, there's an option that lets you display a message on the phone that it's in lost mode and how to contact you. And also separately, a phone number to contact you, which will be displayed on the phone. You can see that it says it will be shown. And the tip is, I would not put your phone number in that spot where it has that. Instead, I would put a new email address in the regular message box. And that's because if it was a thief, thieves are known to try and trick people and threaten them into disabling iCloud lock on the phone so that they can unlock it and then sell it for a bigger price instead of having to part it out if it was locked. So what I would do is instead create a brand new Gmail account or whatever specifically for someone to contact you if they find your phone. That way it's not any consequential if it was a thief who actually stole it. Whereas otherwise, if you put your actual number, I mean, there's messages of people getting death threats and things like that all from the thief and really nasty messages. And you just don't want them to have your actual contact information. All right, next up, this one is one you might have heard before, but never really considered that. And that is to use an alphanumeric passcode, not just a bunch of numbers. I personally have a really long alphanumeric passcode. And it's not 
actually as inconvenient as you might think. You almost never have to actually type in your passcode. It really only comes into play for certain specific menus. And if you don't use it very often, I think like once a week, it makes you type it in if you've just been using Face ID all week, which is usually the case. And also if you fail using Face ID too many times, then it'll also make you type it in. But again, for the most part, you don't really need to type it in. So it's not really that inconvenient and it makes it a lot more secure if someone's either trying to watch you type in your passcode, if they see a whole keyboard come up and a bunch of things, they probably would not even bother to try and steal your phone. Or even if it's just one of your friends who wants to prank you and get into your phone, then again, it just makes it harder in general for them to watch you put it in. All right, next up, this is another pretty simple one, and that is to reduce the auto lock display time. You can find this under display and brightness and then auto lock. And this just determines how long it takes for your phone to turn off the display and lock if you're not using it. The lower the setting, the more secure your phone. I personally have it set to one minute. And you might think, oh, well, that's not long enough. What if I'm watching a video or something and not touching the phone? Well, actually, there's another feature in Face ID and passcode called attention aware features. And that makes it so as long as you're looking at the phone, then it's not going to lock no matter how long you leave it without touching it. As long as you're looking at the phone, it keeps it unlocked. So the timer really only applies if the phone is set down or something like that. If you do set it to one minute, I found that it will dim the screen about 20 seconds before it turns off or after 40 seconds. And if you have it set to 30 seconds, it dims about 10 seconds before turning it off. So you'll at least have kind of a warning if you don't want it to lock, you can just kind of tap it. Another point though, even if you do want it longer, I would not ever set it to never unless you have a very specific reason. Like maybe the device is meant to be used as a kiosk or something and you actually want it to be on all day. So if you have it set to never, at least set it to five minutes. But really, ideally set it to one minute or 30 seconds. Next, I figure I may as well at least mention lockdown mode, though most people probably shouldn't enable this. This one's under privacy and security and then lockdown mode. This one does a whole bunch of stuff that is probably overkill and it turns off a lot of features. Like in iMessage, you can't see a lot of image previews for certain types of files and links. I'll probably make a whole separate video about lockdown mode for those who are interested. But the short version is if you don't know what lockdown mode is, you probably don't need it. All right, moving on, we have the feature require attention for Face ID. Now, I believe this one actually probably is enabled by default, but I think it's actually good to at least know how it works too. The idea behind this feature is it makes it so someone can't just sneakily hold up your phone, maybe at an angle where you don't notice and you're not looking at the phone at all, you're looking at something else and someone sneakily gets you to unlock your phone unbeknownst to you. And that's because like the thing suggests, it requires that you actually look at the phone while it checks for face ID. And also a good thing to know is you have to have at least one eye open for it to work. So if you're sleeping, your eyes are closed, it will not unlock for you, even if it's held directly in front of your face. So that's a good thing to know. If someone is trying to force you to unlock your phone with face ID, like holding it up to your face, just close your eyes and then they won't be able to do it. All right, next up we have advanced data protection. And this is one to maybe consider, but is not probably for everyone. So you wanna think about it. And you could find this under settings and then your account at the top, iCloud, and then advanced data protection. This basically adds extra encryption and protections to your Apple account. And it basically disables Apple's usual standard account recovery processes, as well as adding extra encryption and stuff. The idea being that no one can just contact Apple pretending to be you, and if they have enough information or something, trick them into giving them access to your account. However, if you choose to enable advanced data protection, you very much need to be careful and ensure that you properly set up enough recovery options. If you do lose access to your account with it enabled, one way you could recover it is with another Apple device. You'd be able to verify on the other one that you're trying to recover it. But if you only have one Apple device, then that's something to consider that might be risky. However, there are two other options such as a account recovery key, which is just a big long string of letters and numbers that you could use to recover your account. But you would want to absolutely make sure that you never, ever, ever lose it. You'd store it in a secure place, multiple places, safe deposit box, stuff like that. And you also have an option to add a trusted contact so that if you can't access it, then you could allow someone else to maybe generate a recovery key that would apparently work the same way. And also I would be careful, even if you don't enable advanced data protection, apparently just simply generating a recovery key will turn off the normal account recovery process. So be careful of even doing that, know what you're getting into. So just realize that if you enable advanced 
data protection or you generate a recovery key and you lose it and you lose your other Apple devices or simply lose access to them, like you forget their passcode or something, you will never be able to access your Apple account again. Even Apple will not be able to recover the data within it. It'll be gone forever. So you might be thinking, well, this sounds like a scary feature. Why would I ever want to enable that? But if you're paranoid like me, it probably is worth enabling because it just makes it impossible basically for a bad person to be able to access my account and I'll just be sure to never lose the recovery options. So if you don't really trust yourself that much, then don't enable it. And next we have a feature that is relatively newer and it is the ability to set apps to require Face ID to use them or Touch ID if your phone has that. Now for the longest time, apps could already build this into their app, but this lets you actually do it for any app. You just long press on the app on the home screen and select to require Face ID. So first what I would do is Go to any financial apps especially, and those probably have a built-in feature that requires Face ID. You probably don't have to do it manually, but make sure that it's enabled. If you can't find the feature in the actual app, then you could do it manually. But basically, again, it just goes back to if someone asks to borrow your phone, there's a lot of thieves who are very practiced in very quickly searching and finding certain common financial apps and immediately sending themselves money in a matter of seconds before you even realize what's going on. Whereas if you require Face ID to access it, then they're not gonna be able to do that. So just double check anything where money's involved that it requires biometrics. So I would be curious to know which of these you guys already had set up or maybe ones you didn't know about. We could talk about that down in the comments. Thanks again to Ugreen for sponsoring and be sure to check out the Ugreen NASSYNC DH2300 through the link in the description and use the code for 20% off. If you wanna keep watching, next up here's a video where I talk about the hidden new features in the latest version of iOS. So a lot of stuff that no one really talks about and Apple didn't even mention anywhere. So I'll put that link right there, you can click on. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.